I think it's time to get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of the Coalition for Networked Information, and you've joined one of the project briefing sessions at the um, CNI Spring 2020 virtual meeting, which will run through the uh, end of uh, this month. Um, I note, by the way, that we have just announced a couple of additional uh, sessions for the spring meeting, and though that announcement went out earlier today to uh, everybody who's registered, so please join us for those. Today, uh, we have a really interesting presentation, which I'll introduce in just a second. Um, after the presentation, we will take questions and Diane Goldenberg Hart from uh, CNI will moderate those uh, questions. There's a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen and you can use that at any point during the presentation to put in uh, questions as they occur to you and we'll deal with them all at the end of the presentation. But certainly don't hesitate to uh, pose them as they uh, arise. So our talk today is about crowdsourced unlatching of uh, curricular books. Um, our speaker is um, Mark um, Bilby, who is uh, from Cal State uh, Fullerton. And I'm really interested to hear this presentation because while I've watched the work of Knowledge Unlatched for some years, I, and it's, it's a wonderful thing, um, I've also worried that it's not at enough scale to really move the needle. Um, the project here, at least as I understand it, couples the strategy of knowledge unlatched with a strategic approach to identify materials of high impact and advance a number of worthy objectives at once. So uh, I'm really delighted that Mark has agreed to uh, share this work with us. And uh, without further ado, over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Cliff. I appreciate that. And thank you, Diane, to, for all your work in organizing these sessions and keeping them running smoothly. Um, can everybody see my screen all right? I just want to make sure that that's visible to everyone. Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Good. Thank you, Diane. All right. All right. Well, I'll get started. Um, the page for this project um, on the CNI website has the full abstract. It has a link to this presentation outline. Uh, via its DOI. Um, it's been archived on Zenodo uh, for everybody to be able to access. Um, so this is just typically how I present. I like working with one page handouts that are kind of information dense. So uh, and then unpacking them. So start out with a just an environmental scan or analysis about what's going on in in the publishing world, especially in regard to textbooks. Um, you know, long gone are the days it, it feels like when librarians were concerned about putting copyright violation warning signs on copy machines in libraries for fear that students would scan books and, and share them out. Uh, now everybody's got a high powered, high volume, high resolution scanner in their pocket uh, and a variety of apps um, available to them that can compile those scans very quickly into usable PDFs and share them out uh, with their fellow students. Uh, you know, we obviously live in a culture where there's an expectation of instant access, where uh, people are comfortable, uh, students are comfortable requesting and sharing materials with each other, even on Twitter with the ICANN has PDF uh, hashtag. Uh, there's an expectation of on-demand use. And then there's also, I think, a culture, increasingly culture of uh, course shuffling, you might say, at the start of the semester, where students, because of bottlenecks with a registration or um, just kind of almost sampling courses before they commit. Um, there's a lot of turnover and transitions in those first few weeks of a course. So all that adds to, to uh, is part of the environment in which we should consider uh, what's going on and the importance of uh, reliable open textbook delivery. Uh, in terms of broad economic trends, uh, people who you know, looked at this and studied this, especially in the open educational resources community, over the last 30 years have noted that textbook inflation is really egregious, that it, it far surpasses even healthcare uh, inflation, five to seven percent inflation rates are pretty typical uh, year over year. Uh, and you know, the, the really negative part of that is while you know, in the United States, 
uh, bankruptcy can be a way of alleviating healthcare costs and debts and so on. Uh, with student loan debts, those are not something that can be forgiven. So you know, students are racking up textbook bills, uh, $10,000 you know, potentially in a given program, and then aren't able to ever get out from under that. Um, so it's also part of this uh, broader culture of debt and um, you might say exploitation of students um, that's going on. In terms of content models, uh, textbooks are becoming increasingly interactive, immersive, and value added. Um, we're seeing more curricular support, um, you know, development of lesson plans, um, the availability of grading services, uh, lectures delivered with the book, you know, whether you know, it used to be through CDs, but now through online platforms, which often cost more money for students to access and use. So we're getting beyond just the print textbook to a whole bevy of services. And this is also filtering into pricing models. So vendors are more and more now lending materials and asking for subscriptions, not just from libraries, but from individuals. So now students are being uh, inundated, you know, when they go to Amazon, for instance, with lending options to just check out, a, or not really even check out, but, you know, borrow a textbook, you might say, for just a few months, a month, uh, for the duration of the semester or a year, only to return it. So licenses are becoming, in many ways, more restrictive in terms of uh, the rights that they give to students. Um, textbooks are being re-envisioned as a service, almost like software as a service, now it's books as a service. And that model is really encroaching on the traditional models of purchasing textbooks or even open access subsidizing of textbooks through book processing charges. Uh, you know, it's almost as if you know libraries, which were the, the lenders before, uh, now are being replaced in some ways by Amazon um, and other companies that, that are getting into the book borrowing business. Uh, analytics, uh, there's certainly a, a ton of information out there and universities and university consortia and booksellers and vendors are aggregating information all the time, but this isn't, at least from most universities, it's not being done openly or effectively. Um, the Open Syllabus Project is one of the exceptions to that by gathering hundreds of thousands of syllabi and then scraping the, the data to see what textbooks are being offered. Um, purchasers are really uh, being divided and conquered by textbook uh, publishers. So students and parents and universities and funders really aren't talking to each other. They aren't coordinating with each other in order to bargain collectively or strategically. Um, so, and, and with the virtual monopoly that exists in, in the textbook industry, um, you know, the, the consumer is really uh, at a, a severe disadvantage unless we all work together um, you know, for the common good. Uh, there are more and more, as we know, um, born open textbooks or open textbooks from the start. Um, not a whole bunch. Uh, most open books are in the monograph space, the research monograph space, um, not necessarily in the textbook space, but of course there are organizations like OpenStax and Open Textbook Network that do uh, focus sometimes on textbooks or often on textbooks in the case of OpenStax. Um, but as people who work in open educational resources space know, getting faculty to adopt them is pretty difficult, even when there's formal training or incentives put in place. So uh, the idea here is it's kind of like what Cliff was saying about um, Knowledge Unlatched having this model that, that had been worked out of flipping a textbook or unlatching or unlocking it, basically relicensing a book. That has already been done and Knowledge Unlatched has been doing that for many years now. Um, but thinking about that at scale, not just for research monographs or other kinds of scholarly publications, but thinking about it for materials that would be especially valuable to students in their courses, um, required textbooks and so on. So, I, you know, we can call this any number of things on latching a book, but I also like the idea of sort of adopting a book or rescuing a book or liberating a book, a textbook. Um, and I really just like to propose this as a, as a model, as a, as a new way of thinking about um, you know, publishing uh, instead of creating new content or just being subject to publisher terms about content, re redefining what this content could be uh, through uh, negotiation and then uh, uh, relicensing with the Creative Commons license. So we tried to think about how a pilot could work. And this is, these are conversations that I had with Sven Fund from Knowledge Unlatched, CEO, as well as Chris Freeland, the director of uh, the Open Library at the Internet Archive and Mech also from the Open Library. And so as we thought together about what a pilot might look like, we tried to focus 
on books uh, where there's low revenue potential uh, for publishers. Publishers aren't, you know, books on, on which publishers were not making money, on which authors were not making money. Uh, so no minimal royalty impacts, these sorts of things. We also wanted to look at books that were limited in their availability. Uh, so rare out of print or unlikely to get a new print run. So just kind of sitting there in the back lists for publishers. Um, also books that are print only format. So what, what books that are being assigned in courses that are only available in print that aren't yet available digitally, not yet digitized, or if they are digitized, maybe it's only in the open library. And then we wanted to find books that have, would have a broad impact that were being used across multiple courses or multiple sections of a course and preferentially across multiple universities at the same time. And as we looked at this um, model, you know, there's going to be winners and losers, but you know, overall, it seems like more winners than losers. Uh, the library, we feel like, would benefit from this as an expense where not only could we say we were serving our own students well and saving them money, but saving students globally by relicensing a book. You know, we're not only benefiting, you know, at our university, 40,000 students, we're benefiting, you know, 7 billion students potentially globally. Um, so the, the scale of that, the scale of the benefit is, is astronomically higher. Uh, happy students, students would be very um, happy with the results of this. Um, publishers should be pretty happy with this, especially if these are backlisted titles where publishers are not making any money um, because it gives them a new revenue source. Uh, you know, and it, it would be quick and easy, you know, just writing a check basically for, you know, it could be a few thousand dollars, it could be more for a given book, but it probably wouldn't be a one at a time thing. And we'll get into that as we, as we try to work out the uh, details of the pilot. The only people I think that would really be at a disadvantage in this, uh, if this model really got going, would be the reselling market. Uh, folks who, who buy up textbooks at the end of semesters and resell them to students um, and are making margins on that. So that, you know, that sort of, it's not recycling really, but that reselling industry um, might be negatively impacted by this. Uh, but overall, I think society would win and most of the people that, um, you know, whose interests uh, we should be protecting would be winning um, in this scenario. So the pilot, um, and really this was just an idea, this was a proposal. So I'll, I'll reveal more of that later, but um, with this pilot proposal, what we, what we decided to put together um, was first coming out of the Cal State system. So the Cal State University system has had for many years, a very robust program going on in affordable learning solutions and open educational resources, pretty well known for the Merlot platform of hosting open educational resources. Uh, there's also significant grant funds that come out of our chancellor's office given to all 23 campuses to encourage faculty to adopt open educational materials. Uh, there's been a lot of legislation in the state of California that has really moved the ball on this where courses, for instance, are marked with a little asterisk in the catalog or in the, um, in the registration system if those courses have free or zero cost materials. Uh, we've had whole programs move over to zero cost. Um, our instructional design program, for instance, at Fullerton has done that. Uh, and other Cal State's whole degree programs have moved over to zero cost where they've made that commitment together. But still, the scalability of this is pretty difficult. So we tried to leverage the, the power of the system across these 23 universities, representing you know, 50,000 faculty, half a million students, um, and, and uh, see if we can find some good candidates among, among these. So fortunately, we have system-wide efforts already in this space. And uh, George Wren uh, in our system, I think he's at Humboldt, had already compiled a list of 18,000 ISBNs. And so George was kind to provide that to me uh, to be able to share out uh, with other people. Uh, so we basically provided this list of ISBNs to Knowledge Unlatched. They did a thorough evaluation of the list. And the list wasn't just pure ISBNs. It was also which campus those books were being used on, how many, uh, you know, which courses, how many sections were represented, all of this sort of thing. So it was, it was kind of a deeper picture of how these textbooks are being used. So Knowledge Unlatched then evaluated the list to try to find that sweet spot of books that probably wouldn't be too high in price, but would be uh, advantageous for multiple campuses. Um, and they also wanted to take a bulk relicensing uh, approach to their negotiations. This is from Sven Fund at, at Knowledge Unlatched. He was noting that you know, publishers typically don't want to negotiate one book at a time. It's just a waste of their time or it's, it's, too, it's too small. So really we needed a kind of a book package to look at 
um, you know, preferably in the tens or, you know, dozens, uh, if not the hundreds. Um, at, at this point in our pilot, we really were just trying to find about 30 to 50 books uh, to propose as part of a package and then identify which publishers would be good candidates for negotiating. Uh, we also decided that Knowledge and Latch would be the organization that did the fundraising, that accepted the funds uh, for this, and that they or the library, depending on the arrangement, would create mark records out of these books. Um, Open Syllabus Project wasn't a formal partner, but Sven Foon did, with Knowledge Unlatched, did reach out to them um, and basically use their information to evaluate what books were being used at other campuses, uh, pulling information from their, their database of syllabi. Um, that had been scraped for ISBNs. So Sven had a, had a broader sense of which books would, would make for good alliances among different universities uh, to do fundraising around. So that, that was really helpful, even though Open Syllabus Project wasn't a formal partner in the arrangement. And then Internet Archive was also a key partner in this because we wanted to have uh, an awareness, a platform to raise awareness about these books. And uh, so with Internet Archive, with Chris and Mech there, we decided on the, the wisdom of putting together a central list of these books that could be rescued or flipped to open access, um, but also to have notices on individual pages. So the idea would be almost like an Amazon preview page to be able to go to open library, look at the book, maybe check out the book, and then sponsor it if you wanted to flip it to open access. Internet Archive would also be advantageous as a way to gauge user interest, right? How many times are people accessing that page how long is the queue, the line to access that book? Um, you know, prior to the National Emergency Library, uh, it could be a three week waiting period for just that second person in line to be able to check out a book from the open library using its CDL, its controlled digital lending model. But we like the idea of having a base platform, a base availability platform uh, with a high quality digital version of the book with clean metadata and so on. Uh, so Internet Archive would be not raising funds itself, but would be uh, an, an awareness uh, campaign or, or platform um, to help Knowledge and Latch raise funds for these books. So th that was the basic idea of the partnership. Um, as we put together a proposal, so uh, Sven Fund was especially instrumental in this. So I want to shout out to him, give thanks to him for that. Um, and it's not something that we want to share bro more broadly. It's a confidential document, but some of the most salient points from that proposal that we put together um, was that we would start at about $2,750 per book uh, to negotiate with publishers with an understanding that there would be some flexibility and that the funder that is in this case the California State University would get the final decision. Um, I'm on a committee with the Cal State system called Electronic Access to Resources. So we make, uh, we do evaluations of content centrally um, for, um, for the system and then bring that to our Council of Library Deans. So this was a proposal I brought to that committee. We call it the EAR committee in the Cal State system. Um, part of the proposal as well was that we would uh, buy out all back editions. We didn't want to relicense just the third edition of a book, but not have any ramifications for the first edition, second edition, or fourth or fifth edition. We want to buy out the entire uh, series of editions uh, of a given title um, to know that the money was being invested well to accommodate any kind of usage um, scenario or situation, you know, because it might be the second edition that one professor is using while three other professors are using the third edition. And then the publisher might be planning a fourth edition to come out in two years. We just wanted to make sure that the, the, the whole life of that book um, was, was funded and relicensed um, for up to three years in advance. And then we also wanted to ensure accessibility. Uh, so, you know, we wrote in uh, WCAG, uh, you know, requirements as part of the Whoops. readable so that go. was a purple. You froze for a little bit, Mark. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> You're good now. All right. So yeah, we wanted the files to be accessible, multiple formats, and then available on multiple pl platforms. Um, so and COVID came along. So I, I pitched this proposal to our electronic access to resources committee. We looked at it, uh, but we had many, many competing proposals, right? We have 23 universities. So there's a lot of stakeholders, a lot of constituents, a lot of different needs on different campuses. So this time around, it didn't work out. And at least one of the possible reasons was COVID-19 uh, happening. So uh, certainly when, when that news started to break, we started to get 
concerned uh, in, in February and, and certainly into March and started to enter more into a crisis mode where we weren't going probably to fund new proposals. Um, the focus became much more on wise allocation of funds to prepay things that we weren't sure we would be able to pay for later on. So our council of library deans really didn't entertain new proposals at all. And this, this was one of those uh, new proposals that just didn't get time. But I'm still cautiously optimistic that maybe in a year or two years that the Cal State system will be able to allocate some significant funds uh, for this. And I'll, I'll continue to advocate as best I can um, in that or for that. Uh, the, the Internet Archive National Emergency Library is also part of this now because you know, previously when we were forming this proposal, that didn't exist. Uh, you know, there were limits on controlled digital lending, only partner libraries, you know, maybe they would have one partner library or five or 10, or maybe they, have, they would have five or 10 simultaneous copies of a book. But with the National Emergency, Emergency Library leveraging the inaccessibility of these books where you have dozens if not hundreds of books now that are inaccessible to users, so you know, con based on that, controlled digital lending has a good case to make that um, comparable access um, means you know removing at least some of those limits to books. So that's part of the silver lining of this is actually Internet Archive is now being used much more by faculty and by universities and by librarians as a textbook delivery solution. Um, you know because universities feel at least for the short term, at least while the COVID crisis is happening, that we can count on access to those books. Um, so there's more awareness of the Internet Archive, there's much more usage around it, there's much better analytics. Um, so all of this should be advantageous if we decide to rework the proposal and, and ramp up a new pilot. So that's really what I'd like to see. Sven Fund emailed me this morning and, and said, you know, what are, what are next steps? And, I, you know, this, this last section is kind of what I envision to be next steps. So I think we really kind of need to go back to the drawing board, you know, um, you know, what you, we can call it a failed pilot or we can call it failure to launch or, or what have you, but maybe it's just more of a situation where we needed to wait another season for this fruit to fully ripen in order to really enjoy it. So um, I would like to see if we do a new round and you, we put together a new proposal that we involve the open syllabus project much more inten intently, intensively. Um, in Uh, to, to pull this off. There we go. You froze a little bit again. <laughs> okay. <You're> good. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, if we re-envision the project uh, the, as the proposal, I really think we should involve the Open Syllabus Project, invite them in in a much more deliberate way. Um, reach out to other university consortia or, or major universities, maybe in Georgia. Georgia State does amazing work in the open educational space. Maybe Orbis Cascade or SUNY or CUNY. Uh, if we could get multiple universities all pooling our funds together on this, we would be, you know, a, a juggernaut to be able to really forge a new um, way of doing business in this space. And then major funders, you know, as, uh, I've talked with OpenStax before, and there are times when OpenStax will, you know, get grant funds from, for instance, from the Gates Foundation, it might be half a million dollars just for a single textbook, like a biology textbook, which again, is wonderful because once that's produced, it's available for the whole world. It's really high quality, but you know, would it be possible to just take a very popular book and negotiate with publishers, you know, if it's a half million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars and flip it, um, you know, that would save a lot of time and effort. And so, um, you know, just making this process more transparent and more collaborative uh, is going to be to our advantage. I was just running rough numbers and, you know, for that half million dollars Gates Foundation grant um, for OpenStax to make one book, we could have flipped 180 books um, using this model. Um, so, you know, whether that would have the, a comparable impact, that's, you know, that's something we would have to figure out, but it's just something to consider uh, within this process. Uh, expanding the, the book subsidizers or donors is also part of what I think we should be doing. Um, so, you know, I think having big funds really going big with this is, is the best way to go, uh, whether it's funders or libraries, but also think involving, you know, kind of social media campaigns and getting parents and students involved, you know, if they could give money to a book package, um, maybe individual titles, you know, that, that might not make as much sense. That's kind of what I had originally envisioned is, you know, raise funds around an individual book. And there are operations like that out there on the internet, but 
but they don't really change things at scale, like what Cliff was saying. So maybe there could be individual social media awareness campaigns, crowdfunding kinds of campaigns, um, but they should probably be channeled into the larger book packages that, uh, that, that we're trying to put together uh, to negotiate with with publishers. Um, I think we should, another next step is to create a global open textbook database, you know, just to have a central place where all ISBNs are listed for all university assigned textbooks across all universities, but also get data on, you know, what courses are being assigned for, as well as estimated enrollments for those courses, just to give us some realistic numbers about what the market is. And I imagine publishers have, you know, a pretty good sense of some of this data, but it's, it's not open, it's not out there, it's not transparent and libraries aren't, and universities aren't aggregating this effectively. And then we wouldn't have to, you know, keep our own price or availability information. We can just pull that from other sources. Um, and then another idea might be if we had something like that to actually advance it through uh, legislation, state or national, or through university policies. You know, what if it was state law that we all had to make our ISBNs publicly transparent and available for all of our courses enrollments. Again, that, that information is out there. You just have to know where to look, but to, but to do it in an open way, um, that, that could be the basis of some new legislation or new policy work. Um, another idea that I've pitched that could be kind of related to this is a zero course, zero cost stipend for faculty where you, you just directly pay faculty um, if they make their courses free for students. Um, it wouldn't have to be a lot. It could be based on credit hour, but if that, if that were done by governments, that could really ramp up uh, faculty interest and commitment to making their, their materials open and you know creating open materials um, for, their, for their students. And then I think also a platform like that, a global open textbook database could also suggest OER, OER alternatives, right? If there's a given textbook and we're just locked in negotiations with publishers and we can't get them to budge, maybe we you know, promote a few alternative ideas, an OpenStax textbook or, or something like that. Just, you know, again, the more transparent the whole process is, the more leverage and, and power we have in our negotiations with publishers. So that's a lot of information. I hope that made some sense. I don't know exactly where this is all going to go, but I really would like to continue the conversation and certainly I'm open to uh, new collaborators, new partners, um, you know, in this effort. So that's it. Thanks, Mark. That was uh, a really interesting overview. A lot of moving parts, obviously. Um, just, I just like to say I love your concept of liberating some of these materials. That's a wonderful way to think about it and look at it. Uh, I'm Diane Goldenberg Hart with the Coalition for Networked Information, and I just want to welcome all of our attendees and thank you for joining this session. And again, thanks to Mark for agreeing to come and present virtually as part of this meeting. I want to invite folks now to please type your questions into the Q&A box or into the chat box. And um, I will be moderating. I will read them aloud to Mark, who will uh, be answering your questions live here now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I see that we do already have a question. And I'll go ahead and share that. That comes from Boaz. Hi, Boaz, um, who asks, uh, first off, he wants to comment. This is an interesting project. And he'd like to know, how would or did the fundraising platform work via the internet archive? Uh, what happens if your funding exceeds the needs? Right. Uh, yeah, that's, those are good questions. We actually didn't, this was just a proposal. So we didn't actually get into implementation stage. It was a proposal we brought to our system wide committee and we looked at it. It was considered, we went through a voting process and it wasn't one of the proposals that was brought forward to our council of library deans. So, the Internet Archive was prepared to move forward with implementation again prior to COVID. Uh, that ended up not happening. So this was, you might say, a failed proposal, or it was a proposal that just didn't work this time around. And that's fine. You know, that's that's you know, having ideas and retooling them, re, you know, scrapping them, recycling them, maybe at another time. Uh, that's just fine. So some of those details, I think, would need to be worked out in a new proposal. I, I think those are great questions. If if we raise more funds than what we need. Um, you know, would they be allocated to, uh, you know, a different book or a different um, book, uh, series of books um, in negotiations with publishers? Um, those are all, those are all really good questions. Maybe they would go into like, an extra slush fund or something like that, that could be used for the next project down the road. 
you, know, you wouldn't want to just stop the fundraising. That wouldn't make sense. Um, so yeah, those questions actually are really important and would need to be more thoroughly addressed. Good for follow up. Yeah, and uh, thanks for that reply, Mark. And uh, Boaz also has another couple of questions here. Um, what is the vision around the API pricing? But I think he means APC pricing. Uh, will it show also how close to the target the fundraising is? Yeah. Well, uh, the I brought up the API price in that last. Oh, um, right. yeah. in that last, and that was just to say, pulling data about price and availability from other sources, you know, right. from a Amazon or what have you, uh, in in terms of a technological integration. So um, the the pricing really is it's you know it's it's going to be per book or probably for a, a big you know number of books, forty or fifty books maybe with a given publisher. So it, it would be. Um, all pre-negotiated kind of as a flat fee, you might say, to free all of these books, to relicense all of these books. Um, in terms of uh, fundraising and showing how close to the target, I think having something like that would be great where, you know, there's a little crowdfunding thermometer or something like that that says we're halfway there. You know, we've raised 25,000 for this book package. We need to raise 25,000 more. You know, the Cal States are doing this and Georgia State just contributed 10,000 you know, and then the fun the thermometer goes up. Um, I think that would be cool um, just in terms of the user experience and, and you know, awareness raising. That's a great idea. Okay, thank you. And my apologies there. Um, from Peggy, how did you come up with the $2,750 per, per book price point? Yeah, that was actually from Sven Fund at Knowledge and Labs, the CEO. And um, so I, I honestly didn't, that, that was actually less than what I thought it would be. Um, you know, but he, it, it comes out of knowledge and latch experience doing this kind of negotiation with publishers. So if, if memory serves, Sven told us that front listed titles, new titles, those typically are going for about 9,000 to 13,000 um, in their vendor negotiations. But backlisted titles, they have knowledge and latch has liberated, unlatched, uh, you know, a fair number of backlisted titles, and it's closer to this price point. Yeah. So I, th I think this is a little bit lower than what they usually do, but I think he wanted to start off a little lower, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, to start the negotiations and then see where they go from there. Great, that's good to know and very interesting. Thanks, Peggy. Now we have a question from Caleb Nichols, who asks, um, in addition to saying, hello, Mark, hi, Mark, in your experience, what are some of the main reasons faculty are resistant to OER? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I've taught in universities for 15 years. I know all of us are, are very busy. We're creatures of habit. Um, we develop a course around specific reading materials and um, transitioning over to something that's completely new. Um, maybe problematic. There's also the, the reputation, academic reputation that conveys with publishers. You know, a certain publisher publishes something, then it's good quality. And if it's coming from a newer publisher, you know, OpenStax, for instance, if they don't have that established reputation within academia, then there might be a reticence. But I, I'm all for meeting faculty where they are. So if we can get faculty to look at a new textbook, an open textbook, born open from OpenStax or Open Textbook Network. Awesome, that's great. If we can get them to use resources that libraries have subscribed to, that's great. That's a good initiative too, and I've worked on that before. But I also think we should be thinking strategically about how we can transform the books that faculty are already using. So, you know, part of this on our Library Senate Committee, had a uh, member, he teaches African art history, and he mentioned there's a book that's about 30 years old. It's no longer in print. It's difficult for his students to find. Um, and he would love it if that were relicensed as open access. It would make his life and his teaching so much easier. So, you know, that was one person on one committee I served. I'm guessing there are thousands or tens of, or hundreds of thousands of faculty with similar stories who would love to see some of those backlisted titles flip to open access. So how can we how can we advocate for them? How can we fulfill uh, their curricular needs? Uh, that was, uh, yeah, great, great question. Thank you. And really interesting issues. We do have um, 
time for a couple more questions. If there are any out there, feel free to go ahead and type those into the Q&A box. Um, or if you would like to speak uh, directly with Mark or uh, have a comment you'd like to make live, you can raise your hand, uh, raise your virtual hand, and I can unmute you and invite you to make those comments or ask those questions live now. Um, while we're waiting to see if we have any more questions coming in, I just want to remind you that this webinar is brought to you as part of CNI's ongoing spring 2020 virtual membership meeting, which goes on through the end of May. And I'm sharing with you there in the chat box the direct link to um, our meeting schedule, which will show you the offerings we have through the end of the um, event. And as Cliff pointed out, we have added a few new items, a few new offerings that went out to meeting attendees this morning by email. And one of them is our closing session on Friday, May 29th um, by Cliff Lynch, um, a sum up of the meeting, reflections back on the virtual event and uh, his thinking on the current situation. So please uh, take a look for those and sign up to join us then. Thanks again to Mark for the great presentation and thanks again to our attendees. Be well, and we hope to see you again soon.